We are here, Tip of the Day Live. It's great to see you guys once again. Uh, it's been just a little bit, but we've got a lot going on here at Haas. We wanna hear what you guys have going on, so make sure to, to comment. Uh, go ahead and log on there and uh, start filling in your questions. We've got Andrew over here, who's going to be going through those questions right now, and we're gonna do our best to answer them, uh, or we'll get back to you and, and go from there. Uh, we've also got actually Frank is running uh, our, all of our electronics. He's directing the whole thing, producing, and we've got a, a handful of guys here from the crew that are helping us run the cameras. So what do we right. got going on? Something like six uh, demo day lives up until the end of the year, and also of course the the Haas Tech Marathon week there that pretty much killed all of us. All good stuff. We're so glad you guys could could join us. We're gonna st we'll uh, there's a bunch of comments already here, especially about the TM Zero. Um, Oh, lots Just of new stuff. That video came out the other day. Think. That video the other day came out. It's got like 30,000 views. So everyone's interested in that machine. Yeah, obviously there's a lot of interest in the TM0 and I guess the, you know, all, as well as the updates to the TM line. Um, let's see, right off the top, here we go. Benjamin Carlson, I ordered a TM2P that is due to be delivered at the end of May. Will it be the new style or the old style? That machine will, will very definitely be the old style. They are quite similar, so you shouldn't see a lot of differences in terms of functionality of the machine. Um, next up we have uh, Jay Von Rowe says, TM0 pricing and availability update. I'm old off buying a Tormach until then. So currently we're looking at around October as the release of the TM0 and the pricing is probably gonna be in the 30K or under range. Um, like everyone in this industry right now, you know, there's a, there's a hard time getting some, some kind of material. So. Uh, it has pushed things out a little farther than we wanted. I think it's the same case for every tool builder. Isn't it a weird time right now? It it's, is a it's, strange time. It's There's crazy. We've got, I've got a friend who's buying a house in Idaho, and it was supposed to be done here in the next month, and it, he won't have it till maybe the end of the year because they just can't get wood for building houses right now. So, so Haas has been really good at, at finding multiple sources for materials, this type of thing. Uh, so we're doing really well in our shop, ramping up production. Every day we're, we're building more and more machines. So for those type of avail availabilities, make sure you, you go online, you find out who your Haas dealer is, and just give them a call and, and check and see, uh, you know, when those things are coming down yeah. the line. Yeah, yeah. Iron, steel, our machine's trying to get to, uh, to Europe. There's just, there's, you know, there's delays everywhere. So oh. maybe that's all I should say about it at this point. Ed, it's, I think it's the same for everyone. Um, let's see. Um, I'm going to stop with these for a second, and let's talk about... I, I went through some of the old questions. So these are about, oh, I don't videos? know, 10 months old or something now, but some of them are kind of interesting. Um, this is kind of a, a very general one. Now on two separate videos, uh, two of the, the TOD lives, Lily Kessler asked, the first question was, any helpful tips for young students just starting out in CNC machining and robotics? And then her second question, follow-up question was, or maybe I have these inverse. I work in a shop with a 1996 Haas VF3. Yeah. I'm in the process of setting up for tool and die apps. Do you have any tips and tricks? And I mean, I, I guess you can talk generally about, about where, where, we, where you start people off sometimes. Yeah, if you're just starting out in the industry, it's, it's funny. So moments before we went live just now, we were, we were getting comments from, uh, from, from people about our choice of music for this intro video <laughs> that we had up there. And it was fantastic, right? Kind of get the mood going. And we were joking because um, half of our video guys uh, were DJs at one point. So like, you've got these DJs, and uh, Frank was mentioning that, that it's a requirement basically to produce videos here at Haas that you need to have uh, been a DJ or a wedding photographer, or you have to have been on the line here at the factory and, and have built machines. And it's uh, just one of those funny things. So there's these certain things, and we're joking, right? DJ, video, you know, wedding photographer, or, uh, you know, have built CNC machines, you're guaranteed a job here at Haas making videos. But in, in the, the world out there for machinists, there are certain things you can do to be guaranteed a job for the rest of your life. And so if you were starting out new in the industry, um, I tell you, man, uh, we're hiring a lot of manufacturing engineers, always, right? We've, we're, just, we're constantly hiring, um, well, hiring, period. And so there, I sit across the desk from someone who is interviewing new people, and they'll sit down, I, and now it's on Zoom, these, these interviews, and if they're hiring an engineer, uh, and you've got, you know, went to school for certain skills, but you put that machining you know, experience on top, and, and it's done, you've got a job. And it's not just Haas, it's that type of hands-on 
experience that will get you a job anywhere. And in my personal experience, I started out in a, in a machine shop and then I programmed and I, I ran the machine shop uh, for a long time. And that experience, um, you know, just making parts, uh, just moved me from one spot to, to another to another. And again, at least in my personal experience, it was, it was a cam system. Um, because I was good at the machines and I, I learned the tooling, but I, I, I learned my cam system. So if you're gonna do one thing to, to guarantee yourself a job for, for the rest of your natural life, it's get good at your cam system. Um, learn the control. And beyond that, we've made a bunch of videos to help you out on the control side. We're trying to make this thing so easy to run that you just don't stumble. And even this video right now, this whole tip of the day live, and we do a lot of these type of live things, um, it's kind of just our way of saying hi. We, we've got hundreds, thousands of people across the world that are there ready to answer your phone call. You can call up your dealership right now. Uh, the sales guy will hook you up with a, with a service or applications engineer to answer your questions. And then my job is an applications engineer and I answer questions. That's what we do for a living, like right now. And so you've got a lot of resources. And then we're putting a lot of these things online, like the, the videos that we make on how to cut soft jaws or these uh, tip of the days, well, you know, how to make a vice straight or any little particular G code that you might trip up on. Uh, we're trying to make videos on all that. So all, all you have to do is give it a web search. Uh, but again, um, yeah, find out where the resources are, uh, like the Haas YouTube channel, uh, your local Haas factory outlet. Make sure you know where that resource is and also give them a call if you're looking for a job. They've got shops uh, in the area that can get you plugged in and get your foot in the door to start gaining that experience. But again, if you're, if you're machining, if you're, if you're in a shop at all and gaining that experience, you're going to climb that ladder. So start making parts right away and um, get good at the machines, but also get, get good at your cam system. So speaking of experience, this kind of segues into something that we've been talking about network. And one of the things that you were talking about is the question of what do you, what do you train for when you're training new, you know, pe new people getting into machining? Do you train on a, huh. manual, on a manual machine or do you train for CNC? And I think you're kind of leaning towards, you know, CNC is so much more prevalent now that that's typically the direction you're aiming at as quickly as possible, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, in the, in, there, are, there are shops that are really good at uh, manual machining. You've got people who are, who are dealing with very large, you know, um, items that can only be machined on uh, some type of manual equipment, um, you know. And you have um, people who have spent their entire careers getting good at that. But the world has changed. And in, in, in years past, you had these vertical, you know, tree mills or bridge ports, and those were the machines in every shop. And now, if you go to every shop, it's a Haas. It's a Haas. A Haas is that new type of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, vertical knee mill. This is, this is the machine that everyone's using. Uh, and so uh, this machine or machines like it. So these are what you need to get experience on moving forward in the future. So you want to make sure that your ladder is up against the right wall before you start climbing it. And in this case, uh, just, just biting the bullet and, and moving into CNC as quick as you can and moving into a cam system as quick as you can are, are simply the way that things are going. Um, it, it, it isn't that you can't learn stuff from a manual machine. You, it, yeah. it definitely gives you feedback in a way yeah, that, transfer. that this machine won't. You know, you, gotta, you have to go so crazy hard on, a, on a, a, a regular CNC machine to hear it chatter badly or something. But on a, you know, on a bridge port, if you, if you turn the handles at the wrong speed, you're going to get it immediately. Yeah. So yeah. it's good. It's good to have a, some of that. It's just, you know, maybe you don't spend a year on it, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll be talking a lot about that with the HTEC conferences. Um, you can go online to the, the HTEC web, website, HTEC, and uh, check that out. And again, keep your eyes open for that Autodesk University. Cool. So um, we have a, have a question here from Battle Resistant Outfitters. In the market for my first real VMC, stepping up from a homemade mill, for a four-axis machine, would the DT2 be a huge step down from the VF2SS? No. See, now that's a weird question. Yeah. That's but, a pretty crazy machine to start on, I this is think. This is a total <laughs> misconception. So you're talking about um, a DT, and I've, I've, got, I've got friends that own DTs, and they, they may have started out with a mini mill or a TM. So you've got a, a TM, tool room mill, 
and that's a lighter machine. It's um, a little bit slower XLs, D cells. The motors on it are a little bit smaller. Uh, the spindle on it is a little bit slower, maybe 6,000 RPMs for, for, you know, as, as one configuration. And the machine will machine everything you need. Then you get into like a mini mill, which is, which is a smaller package machine, but it's kind of a more legit everyday production type machine. The tool room mill is an, our entry level. And then you, we've got mini mill, which is again, smaller, but it's not entry level. It's a solid machine. I ran production 20 hours a day on mini mills. Insane, I know. We put pallet changers on mini mills. Long story, <laughs> making hitch covers. And the thing just, it did what we needed. And we just added a second one. But the DT is not that. The, the DT is stinking fast. It's a, it's this sewing machine that where the rapids are so incredibly fast. If your parts fit inside of that, that table size, the travel size, um, the accelerations are, are such that it just gets, gets in there and gets it done. Uh, so it's a very high end production machine. Uh, so you might compare it with a, a tool room mill, but it's a, it's not an entry level machine. Um, it's a, it's a serious production machine, and the, the, you have the DT, which is a, the smaller 30 taper machine. You have the DM, which takes the same size tool as this guy right here, uh, 40 taper. So if you had a VF3 next to a DM, you could swap the tooling back and forth. And there's some trade-offs there, uh, depending on what kind of parts you're running. You might want smaller tools uh, for the balance for the RPM. But yeah, diff totally different machines if you're looking at an entry-level machine. Cool. Um Engineered to Detail asks, am I able to ask questions that I have about the VF2 and tool breakage detection? I'm not exactly sure what those questions are, I but tool, yes, yes. tool breakage detection is, is something that's included in the, in the WIPS package. Um, pretty straightforward to use it, really. It, it's pretty cool. So on the controls, they have something called VPS. It's Visual Programming System. You can go in there, answer some questions, and then when you spit out that code, just a couple lines of code, one line of code, you can have it touch off a tool with a probe. It comes in, beep, touches it off. And what it can also do is it can come in, it'll add an, like an H value, K value. It's gonna check the um, length against what it was touched off originally. And it can see if the tool was broken or not. Um, and, and then, you know, make judgments on whether to continue or not based on that answer. So that's a, a good reason to have um, a probe on the machine. Uh, it's fast, but it can also keep you from uh, when that drill breaks, you don't break the tap after it or, or the end mill after it or the whatever after it. Uh, you can have it um, you know, stop and, and you can get to the root cause of the problem. So yeah, um, broken, broken tool detection uh, is kind of built into the Haas machines right now. Cool. I'm going to go back to a question we had from long ago. This is, um, let's see. Sorry, I lost it here for a second. Okay, so this is from your Machinery's Handbook uh, Tip of the Day Toolbox uh, video. And you, you got a lot of show and tell there for it. I don't, we could probably spend the entire rest of the, oh, of great. the, the stream talking about that. But um, Tim Hess says, here in Germany, we mostly use the, I'm going to murder this, I'm sorry. Oh, you said Fakund this. Metal and Tabellenbach Metal uh, books, which are probably the metric only equivalent of your Machinery's Handbook. And then you were responded to that. So that's... Definitely something you're looking at buying, right? Oh, totally. So I've actually got. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna just pull it up here. I have it on Amazon, but it's not. I wasn't used to seeing that. Yeah. So you can, and we'll show you the picture. But it's a. It's a great resource. And this is. This is exactly one of the reasons why we put out this video. We wanted to see what you were using. And because I'm here in the United States, uh, just personally, I've been to Europe before, and I've seen a few of the books that they use, but I knew that it was that we were missing something. And so this one right there, this. Um, you know, mechanical and metal trades handbook uh, that many in Europe are using uh, is fantastic. So it's just another great resource. We, we saw in your comments that lots of you were using this and so I'm gonna get one and we're gonna check it out. And I love that whole topic because um, this whole series is, is not necessarily about, you know, um, if we can't give you the information right now, if you've got a question, believe me, we will answer it. Uh, you can email us at tod at haascnc.com. You can call your dealer, your applications engineer. We're gonna get you the answer. Uh, we don't always know it off the top of our heads, but we've got a, a book, our own manuals and stuff that we can look in and uh, go, go into. While, while we're talking about that, I'll just, I have to show it because I'm, I'm mentioning it. We didn't mention this in the video, but our machinery's handbook, machinery's handbook, if you guys go, you can check out the video. It's called the machinery's handbook because it's based on it's based on the, the old Machineries magazine by Industrial Press. 
And so um, they came out and they, they made this, this giant handbook. But we usually call it the machinist handbook for some reason because it comes more naturally. But I was just going to mention that we do have the American machinist handbook, machinist handbook, but they stopped publishing this in 1914. This guy is, uh, you'll recognize the name, Calvin and Stanley. This is uh, published by McGraw-Hill, and they, they stopped publishing them after World War I. And then everyone just started using the machinery's handbook because uh, it was really well made. So, so there was a real machinist handbook, but again, it was competitor, McGraw-Hill to the industrial press version, and they stopped making this forever ago. They, I think they came out with a reprint in the, the 1950s and with one version and then stopped making it all together. But um, all these old books that I've got, it's funny because they're all Stanley and um, Calvin um, and Calvin and all McGraw Hill. So these are the books that my grandfather would have used. These are from him. And this one I got off eBay sometimes, some time ago, uh, 1914 uh, machinist handbook. And yeah, check out the, the other video for the machinery's handbook. Lots of fun, interesting information there. But thank you for the comments on what you're using in the rest of the world. Yeah, we got a lot of good comments and, and you know, everything from, you know, tap and drill charts to, oh. you know, and just, you know, I know for myself, my, uh, my machine reads handbook has, it has so many, it has so many um, sticky no, notes in it that it becomes almost useless because it <laughs> takes you as long to look through the sticky notes as it does to make, make it through the index. But, um, you know, maybe the engineers and the, and the machinists have a, a slightly different tilt towards where they're looking at the book, but it, yeah, super useful. Back to uh, comments here. Jason Neal says, I work in a modeling shop, a model shop, and we make sure people coming in know their manual machines as we do have hard inch tool room lays, a LeBlanc lathe, and Bridgeport knee mills along with CNC mills. So there's certainly a, a, oh, certainly a place for it. Uh, yeah. And there's it, a time when you want to, you know, go put a couple holes in something and you, you really, I mean, that's, that's my approach. If I need to you know, mill a slot real quick or something or put a couple holes and I don't really know where I want it. That's how be I care, use it, but. Be careful what you get good at. Now, if you're working at a shop that's, that, that has that equipment, then that is what you should be getting good at. But it's hard to get training for that everywhere because those are very specific machines. I mean, the old brownies, the old brown and sharps, the, the, the Swiss machines, the screw machines, um, those machines are still full, you know, the shops are full of them. But to program those machines, you have to machine out cams <laughs> you know, to create the mechanisms that make the tools rise and fall. And those are very specific machines and they're fantastic, but that's not the industry as a whole. Um, and that's not where the industry as a whole is going to. Um, they're kind of as generally speaking, uh, CNC is, is what it's going to get you the job. And if you get good at, uh, there are definitely lots of jobs out there for manual machinists, but be careful what you, what you get good at because you'll be doing that for a, a, a very long time. Um, I think that most... Uh, and perhaps those, the, the number of those jobs is, is shrinking. It's sure. shrinking, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's becoming so much easier with the software to program. It's, it's like cheating uh, nowadays. And so it's just, that's, that's the way things are going. Because mm -hmm. uh, you can switch from low volume to high volume with, with a button push. Uh, which makes it just a really, really, really uh, nice way to approach things. So speaking of programming, um, let's see. GT Customizer says, I'm not sure if this is easy to answer at, on the live stream. GT, GT Customizer says, how to probe drill and neutral turning insert on SD20Y using the probe arm? How to probe drill and neutral turning inserts, like a neutral maybe cutoff tool uh, or no, neutural turning insert drill. Um, it, it'll probe. So, so typically speaking, um, and we got some. You made a nice little video on this. Uh, uh, yeah, using like the ATP six years ago or something. Yeah, exactly. Like that. Eight years ago. Um, yeah, it'll it'll have a square stylus on the probe. I'm pointing at a lathe to my left. So <laughs> it's got the square stylus on the probe. You'll come in with the drill. It'll simply hit the side of the probe, and that's it, because the drill is always on center for that. And if it's um, if you've got live tooling drill, uh, you can always jog, uh, you know, around until that tool's on center to touch off in the Z. With a with a uh, a neutral cutoff tool, uh, you have to choose when programming where you're going to program that from. Which is normally with a with a funny neutral uh, cutoff tool, you're going to you're going to touch off on the front lower corner. And we've got cycles for that right in our 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 machine. It'll say tip direction three or what have you, or tip direction eight when you touch off. And the pr the cycle will automatically do all that for us. And if I didn't answer that, that's fine. Um, send us an email, send us an email, TOD at HaasCNC.com. We'll get you to the right information if we, if we misunderstood your question. 
And I think that is going to pertain to the next question, which is engineer to detail asks again, okay, I have VPS on our VF2 from 2015 and was wondering what is the best way to have our VF2 check for tool breakage after every tool so we can leave long runners running at night. This, seem, this seems like something that we need to make a video about. It totally and needs a video. Enough, actually, we are... That needs a video. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Because, you know, we're selling robots, selling APLs, selling, selling pellet, pellet pools, all of those things beg for, you know, the approach to keeping your entire uh, operation running. We get this question. So, so it's, it, there's like a, it's really simple to add in a broken tool detection. And then we've got ATM, which is um, you know, automatic tool management. And so it'll come through. And if you can, you can life out a, a drill after it's run a hundred times, you can have it switched to a backup tool. That's all pretty easy. If you want to, if a tool is broken, uh, we can typically have an alarm or not alarm. If you wanted to switch to a backup tool after a tool is broken, we normally don't do that because if a tool is broken, you've got a chunk of broken tool in your part and you're done. Uh, unless you're gonna switch to a different offset, this type of thing. So we've actually got um, a whole team of product specialists though that are con continually updating those templates and uh, for, for VPS. And they're actually, again, integrating more broken tool detection into ATM to have them work more seamlessly as opposed to just, just alarming out if your tool is broken. And if you want to go to a backup tool, a lot of times we'll have people write custom macros for that now because everyone wants to do something a little bit different. And so we can help point you in the right direction with a macro. And if you've got the probe, you've got macros because it's all wrapped up in the same bundle. And uh, there's nothing you can't do, uh, but it might be with a macro statement. And we've got new templates coming out to, to better manage broken tool detection. We already have that now, but it's going to better integrate with our ATM tool management uh, in, the, in the future. And so we're constantly working on that. So again, you can send us uh, some information uh, in an email and we'll, we'll hit your topic directly. And we might make a video on it because it's come up a yeah, bunch of times. Yeah, I, we have this on the list of videos to talk about um, you know, all of the things you can do towards lights out production, essentially, and keeping yeah. your, your process robust. And Oh, yeah, we've got all kinds of crazy videos out there. If you go uh, to the Haas YouTube channel and you search for probing, there's tons of videos on macros. Uh, we, we've got 15, 20 videos that contain videos on macros. And one of those videos is about how to probe a bore and then have it automatically compensate your tool and make, the, make it bigger or smaller. And so um, we've got quite a few videos out there, but there, there are always exceptions. And we'll knock those things down one at a time. Because again, the whole purpose of these videos is to the whole purpose of tip of the day. And a lot of the videos that we do are simply to eliminate tribal knowledge. If we know something and no one else does, it's useless information. Uh, our whole job is to write it down, make sure it's in a manual, and we've got great manuals, and then now to, to put it in a video so, so you guys can find what you, you need uh, quickly. And if you haven't found it quickly, then we will work uh, to make it. Yeah, since everyone's it manual is now YouTube <laughs> I or know. something like it, um, it has to, it, you know, it has to be on there. I know that's the first place I go. I, I usually check YouTube now before I go find, you know, go to the manual for my dirt bike or my car or whatever, you know, it's, it's where you go. Oh yeah. It's, it's a, it's a time second. It's a time stamp on a video instead of a page number. <laughs> yes. That's, that's where we are in 2021. It's, it's funny. I, I, I'm not even this question, but, um, one of these other questions about oh, that came from the machinery's handbook thing was uh, talking about how people save their information and how they bookmark things. And so Sandman Actual said, I have the digital edition. This is talking about the machinery's handbook. Ever since I started uh, having a laptop, I'll never go back. You can highlight and make bookmarks for anything and navigate there with the click of a mouse. I do this for tooling catalogs and other PDFs as well. Um, and we started talking about how, you know, maybe you and I think in terms of having a hard copy of something and, oh, yeah. and the ability to make notes on it. But more and more now, uh, the newer generation is using everything on the computer. It is, it's that way. So my desk, um, I, was, uh, sending, uh, I was sending Frank some pictures. I cleaned out my desk drawer and I had all these notes from all the different tip of the days we were doing and just different stuff, resources that I had. And I scanned a few sheets and then I threw away drawers full of my notes. Um, it's all on my computer now. So, so um, I've got these different pages tagged uh, in, my, in my handbook, but really everything I've got now exists on this laptop. Everything I've got is there, and, and um, I've created, um, everyone's got a different way of doing things. I've got folders uh, on my hard drive with different topics, everything. So 
So broken tool detection lathe, broken tool detection mill. And then inside that folder, I have another, this is, this is the way my mind works. I have a, a Word document that says notes. And it's called notes. And if in each folder on every subject that I've ever done, there's a Word document in there called notes. It's not complicated. And so when I just keep my notes and that becomes a long document and then it, goes, it works its way into the manuals or it works its way into a video and that's it. And so I just kind of copy and paste that and I have so much information. Emails get dropped into that folder on a spe specific topic. Everything's searchable now. And then now, you, yeah. Get every, well, every time that we come, you know, Brian or I will come to, to talk to you about the next topic and we'll sit down and boom, up comes this crazy like, 60 page list of notes about whatever we're, we're interested in. And then it's a matter of trying to decide what, what you include and what you yeah. exclude because there's so much information always, you're always having to, to compact that into something that's- But yeah, that's the only reason I have video. this job, by the way. So the, the reason I have this job, it, or, you know, at least right now, we're working with manuals or working with customers or whatever. It's because we write things down. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we write this information down and then hopefully put it in some type of form that the user can, can make use of it. We're leaving breadcrumbs. Uh, that's why we exist, is not to, to know stuff, because everyone knows stuff. Uh, every machinist at Haas, we all know stuff. And then um, we're just trying to compile it. I'll put it all in, in one place so, so it can be found. I send out emails to, I have a group of lathe machinists that I love that are really good, and I'll, I'll send out an email. How do you guys do this? In fact, uh, on my desk right here is uh, some torque wrenches. These are really cool torque wrenches. It's a regular torque wrench, the click, click, click torque wrench. And then I've got, um, I don't know what the name of it is, but it's a breakaway torque wrench right here. And this tells me, you know, at what point um, I, can, I can check and see how much torque a bolt already has. Or if I'm checking a, a tool inside of an ER collet holder, I can put that on there and see at what, you know, torque the tool spins. And we were talking about how we even mount lathe chuck jaws and how people do it differently. And, and we'll use a crescent wrench or a torque wrench or if you're doing it manually. And I know how I do it. Uh, you I do it like 99% of people do with a, a hex key and, and, a, and, a, and a dead blow or a hammer. Yeah, and I've jacked it up. I, you know, I've made some real mistakes doing it like that when I first started. So we're gonna make a video on that. And, and, but again, I'm, I'm double checking this with all the other, well, not all the other, with a handful of uh, good Haas machinists we've got a huge machine shop at the factory, so there's no shortage of experience there. Um, yeah, we'll take that, we'll put it into uh, some notes, and then we'll make a video for you. So take a look at that. In fact, there you go. If you've got some special way of changing chuck jaws, just like telling us what, what man, machinery handbook. <laughs> yeah, let's handbook, front load this thing, right? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Send me an email at tod at haascnc.com and tell us how you're changing your chuck jaws. I have a very specific way of doing it. I love it, and I've tested it. And uh, we're going to show that way, but maybe you're doing something clever and uh, we can show your method as well. It's yeah, it's like you always say, and, and like everyone knows from watching YouTube, you uh, half of the, the benefit of the video is to is to watch the oh, chat and yeah. see what people are doing differently than you are. And you'll we learned so much from that as well. So I, this, maybe this isn't exactly a, the perfect transition, but Larry Blount says, how about having a live session with the software control manager or team lead? I have lots of questions. And why did you do it a certain way? How about developing multiple MDI screens, et cetera? And that is a, I don't know if we're gonna promise to do the software manager up front, but we have definitely talked about doing other live streams like sure. this. Uh, Brian and I have talked about doing one with John Nelson. Um, this, this kind of style, kind of just an open format. Yeah. So we're definitely looking at doing that. Maybe we'll bring a software software guy in here. That'd be interesting, huh? Yeah, <laughs> it's funny they have a. I think bit it would be it, yeah. it would be that software engineer and you because you you spend a lot of your time essentially being a software engineer and and. <laughs> I, I worked in the software testing department for a little bit, and that was a lot of fun. You get to see what those guys are doing, but what's funny is that the software engineers, um, for them for a big portion of things, they implement. What, what we need and they tell us, look, we can do this. And then we expand on that. But we have a whole team of product specialists uh, that are giving their input. And those guys, those product specialists that meet with the software group every week and talk about how we want things done or what needs to be done first or second, um, they're, they're pros. I tell you, we're in good hands. These are people that have uh, run parts for, for years and years and years and run machine shops for years and years and years. And those are the, the, the people that are in the products group that are given that direct input, as, as well as people like myself, applications engineers, uh, who work more with customers directly. And um, yeah, so the, the software, there's our, our, our air purge. 
Um, so the software department takes uh, constant input from the customers. In fact, and I'll say, I'll, I'll say this right now, if there's something about the machine that, that you are like, oh, this would be great if we put this in as an enhancement or something you don't like about the machine that you need changed, um, I'll enter that in and I'll take your serial number. This is super important. This is our little trick for getting the software changed for any reason or something added. We'll enter it into our software issues database and I'll always uh, create an SAP notification. It's a software that we use to log things. And then I'll put the customer's serial number in that. It's that customer's serial number or that SAP notification number that adds weight to any software project which makes it get done. Uh, because if it's, it's so customer based. Um, the control itself was not designed in a vacuum. It was designed by like Gene Haas and his, and his friends uh, because they were machinists. He owned a machine shop before he built a machine. And so the layout that he first created uh, still stands, you know, 35 years later or what have you, because, because he was a machinist. And so, um, yeah, we, we listen to the machinists and that's how things get translated and, and pushed up on the list for the software guys. Yeah. Um, maybe this is a little slightly related. Rob Maxwell says, I'm getting a prompt that the computer won't allow a connection when using VNC Viewer. <laughs> uh, we made both that hard. VF2 and laptop are on the same wired connection. Any idea where I went where, wrong? I think we just need to make a video. That's because we have a video internally that we use when we, you know, when we go to hook our laptops yes. up to our machine so that we can screen grab all the stuff for the videos. So this is a funny topic. We'll make a video. <laughs> which, that's one of those few things. This is funny. We made a video on how to connect VNC, VNC Viewer as a piece of software, and it connects to devices. And so you can you can put a second screen on on your thing. So you can you can mirror your your screen. So you're sitting at your computer, and you go click click click, and you can look at your different machines. And we have lots of different ways of doing that. You know, Haas Connect and what have you. But um, VNC Viewer is one of those things because of comments from viewers, because of emails that we got after making a video on VNC Viewer. Um, we changed it. We actually made VNC Viewer harder to use. Um, and harder to use, meaning it, it's got all kinds of password protection and this kind of thing. So because that's what people wanted, that's what we did. And so we added firewalls and password protections and all kinds of weird things to VNC Viewer. And so it's, uh, it's still easy if you know, you know the steps to take. And so, yeah. Breadcrumbs, as you said. Yeah, we could use another video on that. Yeah, well, if I'm, if I'm watching Frank's video, I get to watch him do it the wrong way four times before you finally do it the right way. So you're, it's a 20 minute video that should be five minutes. It's a good no, video. At least it gets it done at the end. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, especially things have changed now uh, as we've moved along. Yeah. Um, Frank Staff uh, says, I show your videos to my students all the time. Could you do a video on the indexable insert identification system? Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's a I, I, I love this. I love this. This is so good. Now I'm imagining that he's that sounds like su such a thrilling topic. His students. I'm imagining a preschool teacher, <laughs> and this is this is like this is what they're teaching to five year olds now. <laughs> Insert. I have. It's it's so incredible. It's it's so good, and uh, especially you got mill and lathe, and there's all so much difference. We could talk for an hour on that. This this is really a video that that we can and will do. We've got again some of our product specialists have spent an awful lot of time on this in the last year. And so we'll gather that information. We'll definitely do this video. And with it, all kinds of Haas tooling name drops yeah, along the way, of course. Yeah, and I'm looking at the lathe too. The lathe's, you know, the lathe lives and dies on inserts. And the mills, you know, we've got all so many indexable, you know, end mills and tools now. But even on a lathe, can you can I run a CNMG, you know, 432 and you've got that insert? And then like, wait, I've got a I've got a, a CNMG, you know, you know, 120808 or 120408, you know, can that fit in the same holder as, as, a, as, a, as a 432? It's a metric version, and by the way, the answer is yes. Those are the exact same inserts. But there's all kinds of clever little nomenclature things going on with inserts that we can trip over. Can you put, it, can you put this CCMT in a CNMG holder? Can I put this? No, you can't. But there's so many different varieties, and it's a pretty well laid out system. And the, the, the ISO and the, and the ANSI, you know, the, the inch and the metric, uh, conversions are all pretty straightforward. So that would make a great video. We've talked yeah, about that's this. That's gonna be one of the videos where uh, Brian and I will come to you and say, Mark, is, is there a way that this could just be like 10 to 15 minutes long? And you'll be like, yeah, no problem. Yeah. And then three weeks later, it'll be, 
28 minutes long. We gotta, we gotta, we gotta preface that. Is there we just a way say, we can cut this down? You get nine minutes, that's all you get. So what can we learn, <laughs> that might in, not be we learn in nine minutes? <laughs> oh, but inserts are fantastic. When we've talked about this, again, uh, sitting around talking about topics, especially from mill and lathe, the inserts it's themselves. So you've got roughing, medium, finish, this type of thing. And we have all these different brands, you know, styles of, of inserts. We've got, we've got our HAL and our HUF, all these different insert types. And the land on the insert and the chip breaker on it, you can pick it up and tell whether it's meant for, for aluminum, if it's meant for steel, and if it's, whether it's a roughing, medium, or finish insert, just by looking at it. Uh, so under a loop or the, the magnifier in your camera, we can grab an insert, and you can tell if, there's a, if it's a regular cutting insert along the, the edge, there's usually a little tiny flat. And if that tiny little flat along the edge for cutting steel is only three thousandths of an inch, uh, wide. A little tiny land, that's a finishing insert. You can tell by the chip break on that. And as that land gets a little bit wider, it might be, you know, you know, 10, 15 thou wide, that might be a medium roughing insert. And it's got a stronger edge. And you have some that have, you know, huge lands on it. Well, that's meant for roughing and different rake angles. So there's a lot you can do just by picking up an insert to tell whether it's meant for, you know, the steel or stainless, whether it's meant for roughing, uh, whether it's meant for, meant for finishing, and that's all the chip breaker in there. And so there's a, a whole ocean of information. Uh, yeah, we, we'll try and make that a little more yeah, simple. Yeah, and, and it gives us a chance to point uh, point people that are maybe not super familiar with, with all of the all of the different inserts. You know, yeah. in the in in the, in the direction of what's the generally a good starting place yeah. for certain kinds of cuts. That kind of oh, thing. Oh, so good stuff. I mean, that's and, what and we, we usually were, do. Your tool holder stuff to too. We were you know even the mill holder. We got uh, we were talking about doing a video on some mill some more milling stuff for, for some of our indexables and what have you. The shape of the insert, the rake angle, if it's a, if it's a negative radial rake angle and a negative you know, axial rake angle, you should be able to pick that up and know that that's for, that's for cast iron. That's, that's pretty much all that that insert is good for, yeah. that style of holder. Uh, but then for steel, you, you'll usually end up with a negative positive you know, angle on the, the tool. Uh, cutting aluminum, you have a positive positive or even some titaniums or some, you know, some steels will be positive positive. But there's there's, there are definitely um, formulas and systems that all this stuff falls into that we could break down better. Yeah. So it's funny how sometimes these, the, the comments and questions dovetail into something that, we, that I have written down here. So back on your uh, Make This Part Day 1 video with the, with the TL1, uh, oh, yeah. one of the uh, questions was, Paul Huffaker asks, so I bought one of the Haas double chamfer tools, 45 degree top and bottom. I never put a lot of thought into it until the other day when I wanted to chamfer both the top and bottom of a part to save another op and realized I did not have, I did not have a simple op in Mastercam 2021 to accomplish this tool path. Any suggestions on, on an easy way to do this? So, and, we, and I'll draw this up right here. I don't know if we can pull this in for the camera wise, take a look at this, but I think what he's talking about there is a, is a, um, is a, a chamfer body that's got uh, whatever. I'll just draw all the same. This is the worst chamfer body ever made. So, so if you've got this chamfer tool that is is double sided, it'll pop up and pop down. How do you program this? It really is cam dependent. Now, even just with a regular chamfer tool that's just got a uh, you know 90 degree included you know chamfer tool. This used to be programmed, you know, kind of by hand. You'd have to find a diameter that you wanted to rough at. And you'd program this chamfer tool at, at that diameter, 100 thou diameter. You go 50 thou deep. That's where your edge break, you know, touches off. You'd have to hand calculate that. People haven't done that with a cam system in 10 years. The cam systems today have built-in chamfering cycles, which make this type of chamfer tool really, really easy to program. Um, and so you just define it as a chamfering cycle or a chamfering tool. And so the Mastercam guys, uh, the Autodesk guys, everyone's got beautiful chamfering cycles. I do not know about a double-sided chamfer tool. Uh, because I'm old, uh, getting there, I tend to choose a point uh, where my, my diameter is going to be, you know, where I want it to make contact. And then once I know that this chamfer tool is going to be programmed at, you know, one inch or 25.4 millimeters, I just program that as, is that, that's a diameter of my tool. But this is, that's still, again, that's the old school way. And the question being asked here is if I've got a, if I've got a, a part and we want to come into the hole and then chamfer the backside, you know, how do you do that in the cam system? It really is cam dependent. 
will have to go in and, and that's a great, great question to ask. And in fact, I bet you there's some Mastercam guys in here, there's some, some Autodesk guys who would love to make a video on this. And if they make that video, we'll throw the link to that video uh, in the description of this one and uh, they'll answer your question right away. So if you are, if you're from uh, Bobcat or Gibbs or Hypermill or, you know, one of these other cam companies, uh, make a video on that. Show us, show us how your cam system can handle inductable chamfer mills, double chamfer mills, how you might program a back chamfer. And if you make that video, we will link to it in this video in the description after we repost it on YouTube. <laughs> exactly. I uh, just want to give a quick shout out. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we've certainly got people from all around this country. Um, I'm assuming by looking at the comments. Also, we have people here from Canada, Greece, Indonesia, and Argentina. And I'm, I'm sure I've missed a few others here, but thank you for joining us, uh, for asking, asking Mark all these questions. Um, let me see, I had another one here. Um, is there, uh, Parker Engines asked, is there a way to display an informational message that stays while the program keeps running? Not a dialog box that has to be cleared. Yeah, so this depends on if you're using a, a newer machine or an older machine. On the next gen control machine, NGC machines, which have been out for, gosh, six, seven years, I don't know how long, long time. <laughs> um, we've got what's called an M130, and so you can simply um, save whatever you'd like as a graphic, um, and so I could put my, my text in that, graphic, you'll call up an M130 and then the file path for that graphic uh, in your, your control. And then as the program is running, that's going to display whatever message you'd like as long as you'd want until it reaches another line in the program that, that tells it to turn off. And again, uh, go to the Haas YouTube channel, just search for M130, and we've got videos that talk about that. And so that's really the best way to, to handle those type of display issues um, right you're now. You're saying that persists until you turn to tell it to turn off, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it'll stay up as long as you want uh, while the machine is running. Right. There's some other ways to do that in in, in um, older machines. Oh, this is what we're talking about too. So he was asking about the stuff on my table again. We're going to be going through. Um, I think maybe later on this week we're going to make a video on changing out chuck jaws. Again, um, I have a, a unique way of doing it, which. I found out isn't unique at all, and which is which which is great. It means that everyone's coming to the same conclusion, and uh, you know that's that's usually the way it is. If I've got a really 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 good idea, it's not new, <laughs> and so uh, we'll document that in a video and show you guys what we're doing on changing our chuck jaws. It's something that we do every day, so so keep your eyes open. We'll post that thing in the next uh, few weeks or month. Um, Honest Husband asks, what's the best way to restart a newer ST lathe with NGC to start in the middle of a roughing cycle? Um, it's a difficult thing. We do not have program restarts. So we've got the setting 36. I think it's, you know, setting 36. Yeah, so we've got setting 36 on mills and on the classic control. We do not have a setting 36 program restart on lathes. We've got a whole bunch of things going on with uh, uh, mill turns and live tooling and sub programs and all kinds of stuff. And we found exceptions with all those with program restart um, that we just don't feel comfortable installing program restart on lays. So there is no program restart on NGC lays. So if you want to start a cycle in the middle, really you have to kind of create your own safe startup line in the middle of a program. And um, which is just a simple tool call, you know, T101, it's gonna call up that tool, that offset, and then you start that cycle over again. Uh, that might be something we're adding in the future, but right now you've got to, if you're gonna start a program on your lathe, you must start at the right spot that, where that safe startup line is. Um, uh, and that's the way things used to be on the mills as well. Uh, things are just a little bit less complicated on the mills, so program restart mills, no program restart on lathes today. Anyhow, not that we're not working on it. Good answer. Okay, so Scott Watrous asks, or says, comments, I would also like to see better coverage of boring bars and other ID work on the lathe. Oh. Anyone can get a good OD finish, but boring is a whole different game. Totally. Well put, right, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, uh, we're doing a lot more lathe videos. We just shot a, a big one here, and the guys are working on that. They're editing it up. We've got, um, we just shot the TL video. Uh, on which was an old OD part, the one that we're, part that we're making right now. If you don't have to follow me, I'll just I'll come right back. But so we're making a, a part right now that's got um, that's got a, a nice little bore to it, and so uh, we're running this guy. It's got a taper to it, and this part looks pretty basic, and it is. 
Um, and we're going to show you how to make this guy. But the wall thickness on this part is about 25, 30 thousandths of an inch. And so it's pretty thin. It's got a great surface finish. So the order of operations um, kind of dictates this also. If you're having a hard time with uh, bore surface finishes, uh, then you might want to finish the bore first. We came in from this side first. And so while this was a big chunk, I chose to finish the bore because I knew that was going to be my, my problem child. So I'm not going to machine out the OD uh, and then finish my bore because I had a, a bigger nose radius on it. I'm going to leave this thing a big chunk of material, finish my bore first. And then I came in from the OD, which I had a much stouter, easier, shorter tool instead of something that was sticking out. So sometimes your order of operations changes everything. And just by doing the bore first instead of last, you can avoid problems. Obviously, um, you're going to become really friendly as a lathe guy with your chop off saw. <laughs> you're going to buy a, a boring bar and it's going to kill you because this thing comes in this long and then you're going to hack it in half because nobody needs a boring bar sticking out that long. Now, you can have it stick out the back. You can put a, an NPT fitting on there to run coolant through the bar. Um, if it's a BOT holder, you might have to chop it, put a back plate in to get your coolant fed through it. But it's, it's all about length to diameter ratios. And then, of course, you start getting, you start running into problems with different materials, different um, uh, boring bar sizes. You want to run the biggest boring bar you can, obviously. That, that's always, you know, the thing to do. If you're really running into chatter problems, you cheat and you start going with smaller and smaller nose radiuses on the tool, which is also cheating. And uh, your tool won't last as long, but you're going to get a much uh, better surface finish if you're running into chatter problems. So smaller tool nose radius, bigger diameter bars, the shorter bar, and I'm, when I mean short, I mean short. I mean, uh, you, you know, 100 thou, <laughs> you know, extra length before you hit the, the turret. And, you know, you come in there and run that. And then that's the high speed bars. And then you start throwing money at the problem. You start buying carbide bars, solid carbide bars, uh, uh, which adds cost, but those, those do really well. If you're talking about like an ST40 or an ST55 and you're running into those bore, chatter with bores, they do sell anti-vibe bars, which help quite a bit. They're expensive, but they're great. And then um, there's, there's companies out there like, um, like uh, Global, CNC and stuff. They'll, and, and some of our Haas ones as well. You can go the split holder on your BOT holder, which is a different thing. Instead of going with two set screws, four set screws, you can go the split holder instead of the set screw type holders which on your boring bar is gonna give you a little bit, tiny bit, you know, 2% more rigidity. And sometimes that little bit is all you need to get you through a job. So going with a split bushing type holder, uh, as, as opposed to set screw type holder, can give you a little more strength in that boring operation as well. So there's a bunch that we could talk about with, um, with, with boring operations. And, and yeah, we'll be doing more and more about those type of topics in the, in the near future. And especially with, you know, now that we sell sell boring bars amongst all the other yeah, things. Yeah, that's true. I think yeah. there's a good chance that we're going to be getting information for you and probably also from Bob Singh as well. Um, you're going to be doing, I would assume they're going to be more kind of wide ranging, you know, yeah. all applications kinds of subjects where he would probably be looking at, hey, how do I get this boring bar yeah. to run the right way? Yeah. Um, and, and your insert grades. Oh my gosh. I had problems lately. And so we have a Bob, you'll see his videos on the channel as well. So I was calling up him. I'm struggling with something. And he's like, oh, yeah, you do this, this, and this. And I always run this insert grade or this style of insert. And that, that solves a lot of our problems. But again, if you're having problems with your boring bar, chop the bar in half. <laughs> That's your first answer right now. If you haven't chopped that bar yet, go take it to the, to the, to the, the band saw, the chop saw, the whatever, and, and shorten that, that guy up. Yeah, if you're, cutting a, if, you're, if you're going that deep and you've got a bar that's that long, yeah, you probably, that's, that's a quick way to, to yeah. solve some problems, right? Yeah. Um, thank you again. I just want to say thanks again for, for those of you that are joining us that are not in the U.S. that are probably on who knows what time it is. Uzbekistan, Germany, Sri Lanka. Wow. Um, thank you guys for joining us at whatever crazy hour it is in, in your neck of the woods. Um, let's see. Where, uh, actually, I'm going to jump back to this one here. Um, just a, a general interest or you got a basic comment, I guess. I Exedo, this is also on the make this part on day one, says, as a long time machinist, I wish I was taught this format a long, a long time ago. I think the oh, format yeah. of, of, you're stepping all the way through it. Um, you should do a simple mill part to complete the set for beginners. And hey, look hey, at that. That's a great idea, isn't it? We should. So uh, go to the Haas YouTube channel there and just search through YouTube, Google, and there's a, a complete part start to finish for mills as well on the, the 
tip of the day playlist that we did from Mills. And there's a bunch of videos that go with that that show the entire part set up. What that video doesn't do is it doesn't show the programming necessarily, and, and we're going to do more and more of that. We've got a couple of videos right now that are being um, um, worked on uh, for Lathe. Uh, talk more about like G71 programming, and we talked about our VPS programming, our TLs, and our ST Lathe programming. So we have all this kind of stuff coming up. But when you're saying you like the format and that we're doing it, uh, again, um, Haas is a really big shop, and we have hundreds of really, really good machinists, and, um, and, and, and 99 of them know what they're doing. I don't, <laughs> yeah, there has to be one, right? And so we've got this huge shop, all these really great machinists, but it takes so much work to make a video. I don't think anyone realizes, like when I, and we're making a video, and like I walked over and I grabbed this part, and I held it up in front of the camera, in our normal tip of the day video, in our normal tip of the day video, I would have grabbed this, and I would have uh, picked it up like that. And then we'd stop the camera, and then he reframes the camera, and he takes a picture of me picking up this part and go like this. And that has to be edited in. And it's incredibly time consuming to make videos. So I'm just, uh, Haas has made it a really, really big investment uh, in their software department, first of all, making the machines easy to use, in their mechanical department, uh, making the machines, um, you know, uh, cost effective, making them affordable for, for production shops, making them, you know, run, you know, all the time. These things run 24 hours a day. So a reliable machine, easy to use software. And then now the, the investment that, that um, Gene Haas and Bob Murray and others here at the company have made into the video department at Haas, that's no small investment. Uh, you know, it takes, it takes so many hours to make even a short video. And so, um, I don't know, i just kind of give props to my boss for doing this uh, and, and making all this available. But we're going to continue to do that. We've got more and more videos coming out all the time, more and more experts on different um, processes. But uh, it's a good format, and the reason that not everyone's doing it is because it's really hard. And the reason that you might not get this at, your, um, at, at some technical colleges is because they don't spend 100 stinking hours on a three-minute video. Uh, it's, it's terrible the amount of time these things take. And we're just really um, lucky that, that Haas, I work for Haas, but Haas is so big, we sell so many machines a month. How many machines do we sell a month? I mean, sometimes it's 1,000, 1,200, yeah. 1,700, I don't know, it's a, it's a big typically number. Typically over 1,000 It goes, sure. typically, yeah. We sell a lot of machines. And at that point, um, we're big enough where we can support a video team and make these, these videos for you. So keep coming in with these suggestions for the videos. We'll keep making the videos. We want to make it so, uh, yeah, so if you've got a question, we've got an answer in a video. Absolutely. So speaking of, of more videos, um, this was on the uh, TOD for setting your lathe tool offsets manually. Yeah. Pokey Doherty, who you responded to, <laughs> asked, uh, Mark Terryberry, can we get more Haas lathe G code, like first nine lines and G96, G97 stuff? Yes. Yes, you can, and you happen to be working on another one now. Yeah, so we're, we're doing a video right now. It's on a, a tougher subject. It's a G71 roughing cycle and a G70, and we skip over some of the basic codes on a lathe. We'll make that basic, excuse me, basic nine-line video for lathes as well and cover those things. Some things are, are, are um, they're complicated, and if, if we can spend, you know, like we just said, if we can spend, you know, 50 hours breaking something down to put it in a two minute video. I mean, everyone might know this. Every, all these technical teachers, they know this. They know this stuff. But if we can um, use our graphic department, if we can use our video producers to, to break it down and squish all that down into a, into a 10, 20 minute video, then we can free up the, the, the shift manager's time from explaining that to the new guy or the technical college's time from having to spend you know, two full class days on this topic if they can hit the majority of it in a 20 minute video. So we're trying to support you in that way. And, and that simple nine line video is uh, definitely on, on our list. You call up a tool, T101, you call up your, max, <laughs> your maximum RPM, G50, S2000. We'll call up our G96 or G, G97 you know, RPM for the spindle. Like, oh, wait a second, that all seems easy. We understand nothing was easy about what I just said. Uh, if you command a G97 with an M3 S1000, it's going to start your lathe spindle at 1,000 RPMs. But if you use a G96 and you've got this constant surface footage, the concept is crazy. It's, it's weird if you're not used to it. And uh, it could use a video. 
Uh, so we'll definitely hit that. If you go to the, um, the nine lines video right now, right now this minute, today, uh, we've got a video on nine lines. Just type in Haas nine lines, and then you'll find yourself on the bonus content page for all of our stuff. And you can download a document. And while we have not made the lathe nine line video yet, we created a document, a PDF for that. You can also just search Google for Haas video bonus content. If you search Haas video bonus content, you'll end up on a page with all this great stuff. And there is a document there underneath the nine lines video that has our Haas, our, our Haas lathe and mill nine line stuff, which kind of gives a brief description of the nine lines of code that every machinist needs to know. So actually you were saying earlier, somebody was asking about where do you start? Uh, get a job at a machine shop, whatever. Deburring parts, get a job at a machine shop, start gaining experience. Um, and beyond that, go watch that, um, that, that TL make a part your first day video, and then go watch that mill, uh, you know, complete part start to finish and the nine lines video. And you're gonna be so much better off, uh, you know, for having seen these, just these few lines of codes that are the essentials. And once you hit that, the rest of it, you can learn on the job. Uh, <laughs> it's, that's an oversimplification, but you're never gonna stop learning. There's always a code that you've got to, it's a dictionary. You're gonna grab the Haas manual and you're gonna look in the back of it for the code that you need on a particular day. You don't have to memorize this whole thing all at once. You just have to know those, those nine lines of code and then, then move on. So, um, um, let me say it this right. Andre Tereshenko asks, why Haas Lathe has no washing gun? Oh, what? <laughs> hey, maybe that's something we need to put on the list, right? <laughs> it is. It's it is fun. a little bit less, perhaps a little bit less needed than on a mill, I suppose. Just yeah. Just in terms of chip evacuation. Yeah. Uh, a, lot of times it's, a lot of times we're going with the brush. I know for myself, personally, I've got a, a small... Uh, uh, brush on the end of a stick that I need because I'm usually cleaning the machine at the same time. On the lathes, we just kind of brush it all down to the center and uh, that's it. You can always add a T valve. You can go down, to, this is terrible. You can go down to Home Depot right now and buy a Y valve, walk around to the back of the machine, turn this one off, turn this one on, and add your own hose. Um, but because it wasn't a primary need on the lathes, we're just simply, to be honest, we're just trying to save costs because we don't make Haas customers pay for stuff if if 80% of, of Haas customers don't need something, we don't want to make them pay for it uh, for the 20% that, that might want it or whatever the numbers are. So it really is coming down to um, we're, we're struggling. We work really, really hard to engineer um, high value precision machines that are, that are really cost effective. This is about return on investment. And if, it's, if it makes sense for you, if you really need that wash down hose, um, uh, you can definitely, we've made it simple, you can add one yourself in the back, and we'll, yeah, again, we'll, we'll take comments like this, and this is going to get fed back to our engineers in charge of the lathe line. They're going to get an email because of this video, because of that comment, and we're going to say, hey, at least one customer and, and more are asking for a washdown hose in the lathe. It works its way through the engineering meeting, and it gets discussed. Yeah, and if we, yeah, if you got, if we had 20 comments on YouTube or 50 <laughs> comments over the next three months about washdown hoses on lathes, that would definitely yeah. move up the list. It would, it would have to. Yeah. Um, important Dolphin asks, does the UMC 500 have turning and milling integrated into the machine? No. So, so it's, we've, got, we've got a mill turn machine that we're building right now. Uh, you know, and so we're building that. We've got a whole lot of things going on this year. Some very cool stuff. Our, I'm looking at a UMC 500. That's the point over here. So this machine is, um, the rotary on there is, it's fast, but it's not meant for turning and there are no turning cycles on that rotary. And um, you can run it forever. You can run it. And you could, uh, you know, start it up, create your own, you know, macros, this type of thing, but it's not designed for turning. Um, so uh, no, the answer is no. Yeah. You first. can always get around it, you can make it work. But the simple answer is, is, is no. It doesn't have quite the RPM. But yeah, more even on a super speed, I think you don't have the RPM really to do anything except yeah. really large diameter stuff, I guess. Yes. Probably. Yeah, you'd be much better off using a, um, you know, a, a simultaneous five-axis cycle that's using a C-axis rotation along with an XYZ movement with a, with a ball nose end mill or something. Uh, along those lines, Tucker Millane asks, have you guys thought about making a more traditional mill turn multitasking machine unlike the VMT, kind of lose the benefits of a lathe like bar feeding with the VMT? And uh, Oh, yeah. I, oh, yeah. I think, that, I think that the thoughts are always out there. It's a question of, you know, we certainly are going to release the VMT before anything else 
uh, you know, comes up next after that. So if you go to the Haas website, you know, HaasCNC.com, there's a big banner on the top of it today that's talking about new stuff. And it's gonna have the VMT 750, it's got our, our new UMCs, we've got porting machines, we've got a great big, you know, EC630 horizontal that's coming down the line. Uh, we got all kinds of new stuff coming down there. And um, this, uh, the mill turn that's in there, uh, that test bed is, um, is fantastic. But it's, if you look back through Haas's uh, history, they're, we're always trying new things. We've got these great big VS3s coming down the line. Um, there's always new machines, and if there's a market for it, uh, we'll, we'll definitely build it. Exactly, exactly. Well, we're coming up on an hour right now, so I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna wrap it up. Um, we just wanna thank you so much for joining us on our, on our first live stream in, in quite a long time. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. It's great to hear from you guys. Comment, comment, comment. Even after we post this video on YouTube, after it's, you know, it's re-rendered and stuff, comment. We look at these comments, we respond to the comments, and uh, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss what's coming up next. That's right, the comments that we see off of this video, we'll, we'll try to answer some of those yeah. um, uh, the next time we do this. And we're gonna be doing it. We're, we'll, we'll not be taking a six month break for the, for the next one, so. Yeah, and, and remember that, just again, this is this is a this live video is just one way that that Haas communicates with with our customers, and uh, to be honest, we're just really good at it. We've got a, a dealer network all around the world that picks up their phones, and so if you've got a question, a concern, uh, you can call your your local Haas factory outlet. Uh, you can always contact us, you know, through the through the factory. You've got these videos. Uh, we are really, really, really working hard to to make sure that we're listening and we're communicating and giving you what you need. Thanks, guys.